All right. Judge Henderson, Senator Skinner, if you're close to your cameras, if you could come. Great. All right, let's get started. This is our fifth and final panel. I will say it's been a long day. I've learned a lot. Uh, again, hats off to our, our staff and everybody who helped put this together and all of our guests, of course. So today for our fifth panel, we'll hear from some of the best national experts on these issues. And where I think we're especially interested in uh, lessons learned and uh, models from other states. Our panelists are Insha Rahman, the Vice President of Advocacy and Partnerships at the Vera Institute for Justice, and Allison Shames and Matt Alsdorf, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, were respectively Director and Associate Director of the Center for Effective Public Policy. As usual, five minutes or less from each panelist, and then Q&A with the group. Ms. Rahman, we'll begin with you. Thank you so much, Chair Romano, for having me and to everyone else for this important and timely conversation. Um, I have worked on bail and pretrial policy across this country from having run programs in the courts in New York to having trained judges across the country to having helped jurisdictions set up pretrial services to having drafted and implemented legislation on bail reform. I've also worked on this issue as a public defender for many years in the courts and so know it from many different angles. And today has been a remarkable day of information, of testimony, of sometimes conflicting information. And so I ask all of you uh, if you have specific questions about anything that came up, something that sounded interesting or not right or that you want to dig into further. I know myself and Allison and Matt, both of whom I know well, who know these issues incredibly well, I'm sure we'd be happy to get into that. Um, what I want to take my couple of minutes to talk to this panel about is really the issue of public safety, because at the end of the day, what is undergirding decisions to change the bail system or to maintain the status quo is how we approach the question of public safety. And I caught a little bit of the last panel and the sort of disagreement, if you will, about, well, you know, we move to a, a system of considering risk to public safety when considering bail or release decisions. And the truth is, I think that ship has sailed when it comes to the law in this country and when it comes to what the public is willing to bear and consider when it comes to supporting pretrial justice and pretrial reform. And the truth is, I think we benefit from all leaning into the question of public safety and getting it right. Because if we are to properly consider public safety in each and every policy and practice decision that we make around the current bail system, we would have no doubt fewer people in jail, fewer people behind bars. We would have better due process. We would have a better process for determining who in fact can remain safely in the community and walk free among us and be in their homes with their families and their jobs while awaiting trial and who in fact is the very, very small percentage of people who pose too much of a risk to public safety to be released during the pretrial period and to make sure that there are due process protections to ensure their safety while they're incarcerated. Because indeed, when we think about public safety, we often talk about the public, but we have to remember people who are in the system and people who are incarcerated are also members of our communities and there is an obligation to public safety there too. And so with that safety frame, I wanna name a few important things. One is we cannot have a one size fits all approach to each and every case. And in the name of public safety, what any good effective pretrial system should do, New Jersey is a great example of this. You heard from Judge Rabner earlier today. New York is a good model of this. Illinois will be putting this into effect in January, 2023 where the vast majority of people after an arrest, they do not even see a judge immediately. They are cited and released to go home and come back to court on their own recognizance at a later date. And we have now almost six years of data from New Jersey and two and a half years of data from New York where this has happened, where close to 80% of people are just released. And people show up to court and people actually stay safe during the pretrial period. 
Pre-trial re-arrest rates in both New Jersey and New York have not changed as a result of bail reform, even though fewer people are behind bars in both jurisdictions. In New Jersey, the jail population has dropped by 47%. In New York, it's a little over 30% overall. The second is that we need to make sure that there is an appropriate fact finding for who should be released and under what conditions versus who might need to be detained during the pretrial period. And there's two separate inquiries there. For one, there's an inquiry around the level of the charge. And if somebody is facing a charge where there are no allegations of serious or violent conduct, it should be a very strong presumption, if not a mandate for release. The discretion there is around then what conditions uh, would help support the person to return to court and stay safe. Again, New Jersey is a great example of you can release people, even people charged with serious and violent felonies, and they return to court and they stay arrest free during the pretrial period. In New Jersey, if people released and about over 90% of people are released, and in New York, it's somewhere close to 88% of people are released, uh, the rearrest rate for serious and violent felonies is less than 2% overall. That is a tiny, tiny number. We would love to get it down even closer to 0%, but I still put out that less than 2% number to say only a tiny portion of people actually are arrested again for a serious or a violent charge when released. And then the inquiry around how people uh, should be considered for pretrial detention, because the issue about the detention net is an important one and using pretrial incarceration parsimoniously. And Illinois is a really good example of where other places should look to. The specific language uh, for considering risk to public safety in the new Illinois pretrial legislation is essentially that uh, there needs to be a fact finding of whether the person will pose an individualized and specific risk of harm to another person. And that is important because otherwise risk to public safety is currently written under the California Penal Code and in other jurisdictions allows for conduct that has no bearing on public safety to be swept under the public safety rubric. So that's my second sort of strong uh, suggestion to this uh, committee. And then the final one is about how we actually do pretrial services and supervision. And again, we've heard from other panelists what models work in terms of supporting people to return to court and what actually seemed to set people up for failure. And New York City has now for years had a pretrial services uh, system that is community-based, that is strengths and supports oriented. And what we find is that 90% of people return to court. The pretrial rearrest rate is only slightly higher than it is for people released on their own recognizance. And mind you, people under supervised release are higher risk. That's just part of the nature of why they have supervision versus not. And yet they engage in treatment and services in um, you know, resources that address their needs. And that actually means they come to court and they stay mostly arrest free. So again, that's the model that we know works. I'm looking to the data because I think the data helps us actually get out of the feelings and the emotions and the interests that often drive these conversations and it helps us understand what works. So with that frame, I will stop here because I'm sure I've hit my five minutes, but I really hope that thinking first and foremost about public safety helps to guide us in the right choices about where California can go. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Shames and Mr. Alsdorf, I, I assume you guys are splitting your time. Is that how you guys have, or you, Tom? Alex, <clears throat> I think we were each going to have a few minutes. So, okay, each, each, so. take, each take five minutes, but okay. it's the, the, the Q&A is really what makes it uh, best, so. Yeah, absolutely, so. and thank you so much, and thank you all of us for having us today. Um, I want to echo a lot of what Insha said, and really the point I wanted to make at the very beginning was to make sure that we walk into this as the data that you heard from Insha says, the vast majority of people on pretrial release will succeed. The assumption of too many people going into that courtroom or when people are arrested is that there will be a failure. And so I think it's really important for whatever you do even just in your mindset as you approach your recommend, approach the recommendations that your committee will make, 
is to remember that we often hear about the horrible case. And we heard today from someone who said, you don't often enough hear about the successes. But the, I'm gonna say it again, because if you hear nothing else from me, the vast majority of people, upwards of 80%, 90%, as you just heard from Insha, will succeed often on little more than a promise to appear and a, and a promise to abide by the, by the laws. People will comply, the vast majority of them. So we need to walk into this and make sure that that assumption of failure is flipped. Assume success. We need to make sure that the assumption of guilt is flipped. There is a presumption of innocence. And I wanna echo what a lot of people have said today, there should be a presumption of release for everybody. That is what our Supreme Court dictates in Salerno. That presumption can change and it can change by the, by the state bringing a petition to detain and, and then set a high bar for them to prove to detain that person echoing Insha to say, you have to focus on public safety. You have to focus on that dangerousness, what people are most concerned about. But flipping that those assumptions and the presumptions are super important to keep in mind as you approach this topic. The other thing I wanna mention is to remember the goals of pretrial that we start with. The Supreme Court has said that the court should be concerned with just two outcomes appearing in court and keeping people law abiding. And so whatever you do, when you look at using money or whatever it is, you have to ask, does this condition of release help to promote those two goals? And I think you're gonna hear a little bit more from, from my colleague about, about money and the evidence and really the lack thereof about promoting those goals. But what is the point of putting conditions on someone if it does not help to promote those goals? So I think keeping that in mind um, would be very important. And along, along the lines of money as well, and you've heard a lot today, I've been able to listen into to a bit, is that, and you've heard about money keeps in the poor. I'm not gonna repeat any of this, right? And it can also obviously let people who are dangerous out because if they can afford the bond. But even more, and I, we didn't hear this directly, is that using money as your proxy, right? takes the decision away from the judge. And we didn't hear that so much, but the judge should be making these decisions. And by letting it, relying on a bail schedule, which is at the end of the day, just another form of, of prediction. That's what judges are trying to do when they're making these decisions. They're trying to predict who is going to be a danger back in the community. It's a guessing game. But a bail schedule is that same guessing game. So it's a different sort of assessment. The judge should be making that assessment. They should be making it with due process, with reason, with meaningful representation, as we heard from a number of people today. I also want to um, just end it, and I'll pass it over to Matt, although I've agreed with a lot of other things we've heard today, is just listening into the last panel. I have worked, Matt and I both have worked in many counties in California. We are working with Illinois to implement their laws. We have worked in New Jersey. We're familiar with a lot of the statewide models across the country. But I cannot emphasize the importance and perhaps for each of you to go on a little road trip and sit in on arraignments in various diverse counties across your state. You will be so, happily surprised at some, you will be horrified at others. You need to go see what, because you heard in the last one and with the judges, you heard different views of what's happening. They think it's true around the state, it's not. Special things happen in some counties, but really horrible, unfair, unconstitutional practices are happening around the state. And you need to see that, I would really highly recommend um, a bit of a trip to see some different jurisdictions. Thank you. And happy to ans answer any questions. Oh, I'm sure. Don't worry. I got them. All, All right. right. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and it's an honor to be uh, here with you today. So 
I'm just going to pick up on a couple threads that I've heard earlier in the day and that both Incha and Allison mentioned. And I don't, you know, I think that you all are looking much more broadly than the role of money in the system. But I did want to revisit a couple points that have come up uh, a couple times, at least from what I've seen. One is what Allison mentioned, which is just to be really clear about the evidence around secured financial bonds and the fact that there is really no peer-reviewed or reliable evidence that shows that it does either of the two things that are permissible uh, concerns of the pretrial system or, or of the criminal legal system, which is court appearance and um, ensuring, ensuring law-abiding behavior. That is um, directly stated in the O'Donnell opinion, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with from 2017 out of Harris County. And I think it just behooves us to bear that in mind, even if we set aside the question of whether money results in detention, which of course we can't, but even if we were to, I think we should be thinking about what is a financial condition of release, particularly a secured one, meant to achieve? What is it meant to do? What, you know, what is it meant to affect? And if the evidence shows that it doesn't actually increase either of the two permissible outcomes for the judiciary and the court system to be looking at, then why are we imposing it in the first place? So I do think that's a really important evidentiary and framing point uh, for you all to bear in mind. I think the other thing that we heard that, that I wanted to just bring to your attention is the notion that financial conditions of release or money bond expedite the release process. And no doubt that is factually true right now um, in certain jurisdictions in California, perhaps many, but I don't think there's any reason that has to be the case. Using a bond schedule or money or whatever, that is a form of delegated release authority. Um, and there are ways through legislation, through court order, that that can be modified and people could be released without paying any money. Um, and so the, the, the notion that in order to expedite release, we need to rely on money in some capacity, I just don't think is in fact the case. And I, I encourage you to kind of interrogate that idea and look at alternatives and think about it in the context, the broader context of delegated release authority. Um, and then the final point is just to really um, build on what Incha said around preventive detention and public safety. Uh, you know, it, the notion that there isn't preventive detention now would come as news to um, you know tens of thousands of people sitting in jail tonight, uh, or who had who had what I think others have referred to as sub rosa detention amounts of bail uh, posted that were in or, or set that were intended to keep them behind bars. So I think the relevant discussion really for all of you is there is probably a group, a narrow group of people who need to be detained or who could be eligible for detention before trial. Let's try to define that as best we can and ensure that there are rigorous uh, procedural and due process protections for those who might be subject to it, but not to think that a switch to a preventive detention system would be a wholesale change from what we have now. The change would be that it would be intentional, that judges would have to justify their decisions, would have to put that on the record, and that it would, you know, in the, to take the example of, for instance, New Jersey, it would have to come at the behest of the prosecutor in the first case. So I, I just kind of, those are some miscellaneous points, but I wanted to tie up those loose ends before we go to questions. That's super helpful. Thank you. Uh, let me just write a note down. All right, before I launch into my questions, does any committee members have questions? All right, well, please chime in. Um, I want to start with the idea, I think, that uh, Ms. Rahman, you began with and was picked up by Ms. James about this idea of um, expanding people who can be released on OR, or is this the same as site and release? I just want to use our sort of colloquialisms the same. Site, site and release, summons release, administrative release. There's lots of different terminology for it across the country. But yes, the idea is it is without too much sort of 
fuss or an appearance before a judge release immediately after arrest. So you're saying in New York and New Jersey, it's between 80 and 90 percent of people who are released without any conditions and without any review. Is that correct? So the number of people in New Jersey who are released on what's called um, it's essentially a, a summons release is 68 percent in New York. It's roughly at this point, there's been two rounds of rollbacks to New York's law. It's somewhere around 75 percent. Um, and it is people in both jurisdictions who are charged with certain low level misdemeanor and nonviolent felonies where there are no outstanding warrants um, or failures to appear or any other reasons that the person would need to appear in front of a judge, such as getting an order of protection or stay away order, a license suspended or other sort of uh, concerns around safety or an administrative or judicial process. So just if clarify. I could just jump in to, to clarify, because I think the, the terminology that's used across the country is all very different. So a site and release is something that the law enforcement officer does on the street. Mm -hmm. So they see some behavior that they believe is illegal and they essentially give them a ticket, mm -hmm. right? So that it's a site, a citation that says come to court on X date. And that's called a... a um, in New Jersey as a summons. So that is happening in the field, right? Because the goal is to do no harm to people, oh, right? Yeah. So yeah. get them out as quickly as possible. So you could do it in the field, on the street, through a ticket, essentially, a site and release. If you do decide to bring them in for custodial arrest, there is also an opportunity for release by the, at the jail whether that's the police or the sheriff, that has different names. It could be often, it could also be called a site and release, but it's at a different point in the system it is when there's some booking, they might be checking the records a little bit more because records are, it's, it's you know, available differently at every place. I get it. So we get that's going. also the opportunity, that's delegated release authority in sort of the way that we talk about it. So those are the two earliest opportunities to do something before they're held for the arraignment. And just so I understand, before we get too far down the road, I want to understand these clearly, that there is a, a list of crimes that if you're arrested for, with certain exceptions, which seem commonsensical, that you first can get, is, is it required, mandatory site and release? Not it's in New Jersey. In places. It is in New York. It is going to be in Illinois when it goes. So into it's mandatory that. for a certain. It's, it's, go ahead. It's it's. I, I would say it, it's. There's a presumption of release for certain classes of offenses, but if the person is an obvious danger to themselves or to someone else, then there's some um, exceptions. And I will say it's allowed in California right now, so it is being practiced in some counties. And then you will find some counties where it doesn't happen at all. So this becomes not so much a state law, but really a matter of policy that needs to be driven at the local level to encourage. And in, I mean, in, in New Jersey, it's encouraged can, through a policy. So I but think just that's- So I understand in California though, there's, there's some people who want to expand the categories of people who are eligible, at least statutorily, and I understand it's not being implemented, at least statutorily eligible for site and release. Is that correct? Yes. Question, who determines whether they're a risk or a danger to themselves or others? Law enforcement? Law enforcement. Yeah. yeah you know, I can think of a situation on, on DUI arrests where uh, right, you, individuals right. arrested, take it in. Basically, the idea is they sober up and then they're cited out in the morning. That yes. happens all the time. Yeah. Right. And under New York law, DWIs are not one of the offenses for which you can get, it's called a desk appearance ticket under New York laws, trying to put a sort of generic term on it to sort of describe the practice. But to Allison's point, there's different variations of it. There's some kinds of offenses, domestic violence, where it's just those are part of the exceptions. But you think about, you know, a significant number of arrests in every jurisdiction and California is no different is drug possession, simple, low level larceny, other kinds of so-called quality of life offenses. 
imagine if all of those kinds of offenses, other first arrests where there's no outstanding warrants, no other concerns about public safety. Imagine if there was a simple process where those folks are released literally within 12 hours of arrest and given a date to come to court, the vast majority do. It frees up resources for the system and the courts to pay attention to the cases where there's more complexity, there's more of a need for inquiry, there's more need for due process. All right, so according to data that's in our reports, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, this is from Judicial Council, and I know that they have noted it's limited, the data is not perfect, right? No, none is, but from what we have in California, it seems that in many counties, at least, Sight and release results in a significant number of arrestees being released, mostly misdemeanors, but also some felonies, maybe upwards of 30 to 50% in some counties. Um, is it your impression that to increase the number of people who are sight and releases, it's mostly, it would be statutory change would be helpful or the, or the implementing what we currently have in a better manner? I guess, Ms. Shames, let me put that to you first. Yeah, I, I mean, I think both. I mean, I'm not, right, so I, I'd have to look at, at look to see what your list of exceptions or inclusions are. Um, so you maybe be able to increase the inclusions to some extent. It might even be almost better to start with exclusions and sort of have that presumption of release for the vast majority of offenses. Um, but I, I think that local policy and the local practice is where, the, you know, really the rubber hits the road in terms of um, meeting your goals that you're trying to achieve of early release. Got it. If I can Thanks. offer a slightly different perspective, having worked on this kind of legislation across the country, I actually think statewide legislation is really important to standardize the practice. So each county can do the same thing and there is support from the state, from an agency or an oversight authority to make sure each county is doing it with the right resources and supports and guidance. I do think that, especially in a place as big as California, that that's gonna be necessary. Allison, I'm assuming you would agree with that too. I saw you I 100% agree. Hand. I didn't mean to minimize the state law. I just mean to say that local implementation, matters. the state law is great, but if no one does anything, then there's no, no goal, no uh, outcome. So I know you all have thought about this more than I have, but especially listening today and doing my homework for the hearing, I've, and, and please correct me if you think that this is a wrong way of thinking about it, but in trying to parse out the different issues and different ways that the legislature might be able to in, in improve this. This is so big, it's, the terminology is all over the place. It's this discretion, this county. So I'm really trying to um, focus. I sort of see two phases, I wanna call this. There's the pre-arraignment, at least the way that we have in California. It's pre-arraignment phase. The way that that works now is that we have this bail schedule, right? And if you can make the bail schedule or actually more likely make 10% of the bail schedule for whatever you happen to be arrested on, you're out and you're out pretty quickly. It seems like you're out quicker than almost any assessment could be done realistically. Aside from a just straight site and release with no assessment, and that when we're talking about the site and release, it's pretty much no assessment, it's just what crime you're convicted of. Likewise, a bail schedule has no assessment either, it's just what crime you're arrested for, and then it assigns a number to it. Um, and that's where almost all of the money bail problem comes into play, is in this pre arraignment period. Do you agree with that, all three of you? I think you're getting a bunch of looks because it's like, not really. Um, okay, we just heard in the last panel that about yep. guesstimate was 90% of bail, yep. money bail was issued pre-arraignment. Yep, yeah. And then, so absolutely it's an issue there as in the fundamental question is Matt asked why or is money being used at that stage we, at no, all? No, 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 uh, yes, I, I got that. I just want to know if get our facts right before we figure out why and should we still be doing it. But is, is that where money bail in California is really, it's, 
it seems like the vast, ma- according to the bail industry, the vast majority of the ball game is pre arraignment. So it, the it, vast majority of bails that are made is at that stage. And then I sat in court in a couple of different counties in California, and the amounts of bail that are set in court in California are eye popping to me. And I have no, sat. I, in I court appreciate in lots bail, of that's, so, bail that's made. So. We know that bail that's not made and was proxy. But as far as the money bail, it's actually being made, and mm-hmm. it's it's mostly at that pre arraignment period. Yes, absolutely. Mr. Elser, were you going to? Yeah, well, I, I was just going to say maybe this goes without saying, but just that that that's where it's initially set, but then people who don't bail out at that point go to an arraignment, and then it can be revisited and reset at that point. Um, and so it's, you know, it can, it's not as though that's the only point at which it factors in the system. It continues down the line because I think, I, you know, as a, as a default, uh, I think we all would tend to defer to what had been established before. Um, and so the bail schedule tends to set a presumption in people's mind of using money. And so it, it continues throughout the system. So that's my well, only nuance to your, yeah. I appreciate that it can be revisited at arraignment and afterwards. And DA um, Cousins alluded to the separate penal code section. So I appreciate that it can be and it can be revisited along the way. But in terms of where it's actually being used and the actual impact of the money and the sureties and the prior premiums, that's all pre-arraignment issue. I still think I would say it's, a, it's an arraignment <laughs> issue as well, because people post-arraignment continue to be held because of the, the bonds that continue to. So, so I'm not sure if there's a distinction I'm missing here, but I certainly wouldn't say that the impact of money is felt only within that like first 48-hour period. It, it extends well beyond that. Okay, that makes sense. I understand that. Um, in the in the arraignment situation, there is a lot of discussion about having um, faster evaluations, and there was a suggestion of merely telling the public defender, "Hey, Joe Smith has been arrested," that that will help expedite the process significantly. Do you agree, or are there other ways that you might expedite the process? I mean, obviously the legislature could say it's no longer 48 hours, it's 24 hours and get your act together. Um, But are there other ways that we can expedite the arraignment situation? Well, I wanna go back to the sort of, who are we just getting out sort of quickly within literally 12 hours after arrest and they don't ever come into the courts and in front of a judge. And I just want to give one more example to um, all of you, which is from Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky passed a, what's called administrative release. It was an emergency court order statewide during the pandemic. And it was basically most misdemeanors, many nonviolent felonies, and the exclusions were narrow. There was no necessarily a a deep sort of assessment. They do use a risk assessment there. So they sort of laid it with the risk assessment, which is what New Jersey does for some category of more serious uh, offenses that are considered for immediate release. But there's a quick way to do it. It actually doesn't have to be any longer than the bail sort of, you know, the the jail bail process that currently exists in California. Um, New York, for example, gets people out on desk appearance tickets literally within four to six hours after an arrest. It's really quick. So I do just want to go back to that to say there is a quicker way to do this than being booked into jail, which necessarily will take at least four, six, eight, ten hours, and then having a bail amount set because of the bail schedule, getting somebody there to pay it that is going to take longer than something that is more of an automatic process. In terms of actually then speeding up who goes in front of a judge, and mind you, going in front of a judge doesn't mean that uh, detention is necessarily on the table. Both in New Jersey and in New York, there are people who go in front of a judge uh, and based on their charge and the sort of circumstances, they are not being considered for pretrial detention, either through bail in New York or just preventative detention in New Jersey, they are still going to be released. The question is under what 
uh, conditions. And so there's a, an inquiry there about the right conditions to support that person to come to court, which is anything from court notification, which is incredibly effective and works, to pretrial services, to more serious levels of supervision, like electronic monitoring, which uh, just a footnote there, I don't know if Judge Rabner talked about this, but New Jersey is really revisiting their use of electronic monitoring after six years of experience uh, using it. Um, so that process can happen again quickly. In New York State, it happens for every single case within 24 hours, and it is possible to do so. And even in more rural parts just, of just, New York just so State. I understand, just so I yep. understand, every case in New York within 24 hours, Sundays, holidays, whatever, every single case judge. before a judge? Yes. And can I say a little bit about how that works in sure. places that are not New York City? Um, it basically works that there are arraignments that are held there at a set time uh, and there's a centralized arraignment part. So in a large county, it's just literally one courtroom. Ideally, it's in person. In New York, it is, but you can imagine doing it virtually if need be. And the public defender, the DA and the judge, they're just assigned to be there 8 a.m. in the morning, 8 p.m. at night. You just do it. It's your week. You're on duty. It happens. It works out. It's just you have to agree to there is a set schedule for it, and then it means people get seen quickly. So people getting seen quickly, I, I obviously see the advantage of it, but within that period of time, it's almost impossible, it would seem to me, to, to evaluate somebody's needs and really get a program set up for them in that period of time. That's Is that fair? Or I mean, so why are we even doing it at all, I guess is what I'm saying. You know, yeah. why not have more sight and release instead of going through the, in order for, you know, the idea is you should go before a judge so they can cite, so they can impose appropriate services or requirements or supervision. But if we're doing it so quickly, how can anybody make a really informed decision? Well, if I can suggest one, sorry, sorry, one potential middle ground is really rather than thinking of it as the judge issues in that very, as you're right, very constricted time period of very specific order with all of the conditions, rather, I mean, this is where pretrial services and supportive services can really come into play is to say, okay, you know, look, we're only doing a back of the envelope kind of assessment of who this person is, what risks they pose, what their needs are right now. We have a general sense that they're, let's say, on in the medium band. That means they go to pretrial services. Pretrial services then does the deep dive to figure out what among the menu of options that are available to them and are, and are again, this is sort of a delegated court authority situation. They can then do the, the more um, in-depth evaluation of, again, I think through, through the lens less of imposing conditions and more of what does this person need in order to be most successful on pretrial release. So I know not every jurisdiction has that level of pretrial services, but I do think that's a really important model for a lot of reasons, including the one that, that you said. And pretrial services can, I know that it's not all conditions, but they can set the condition. So the court you're saying delegates saying, okay, you go to pretrial, whatever they say, you have to do that. Yeah, yeah. or say, you know, if you're a cat in this category, here you could be subject to check-ins between once a month and once every week or what, you know, whatever it might be, the court could set some parameters uh, around the discretion of the agency. But that's a way to kind of, I think, toe the line between what you're suggesting correctly um, and still allowing the, there to be a more fulsome assessment of the person. Yeah, and, I wanna um, echo that. I think yeah. that's exactly right. But I think we've also seen places that really um, right over condition and over order conditions. And so yeah. this distinction of court ordered conditions versus um, services and, and helpful um, assists that a pretrial services organization or community organization can do is important because if someone doesn't attend a treatment program, is that really something where their pretrial release should be revoked? No, because the court should be focusing on appearing in court and if they're law abiding. So if they're doing those things, but they don't go to a treatment program that the court orders, really is that a reason to revoke their pretrial release? That really should just be something that the pretrial services is offering to folks 
to support them and improve their lives, which, you know, obviously ensuring that they come back to court and stay out of trouble. But I think that distinction is important in terms of allowing the court to order too much versus allowing pretrial services to do the deep dive, as Matt said, and identify what supports people need to make sure they appear in court and uh, stay law abiding. So I think it's really overwhelming to imagine a court trying to figure out everything a person needs within 24 hours and connecting them to it. What we know is there are a good number of people who simply can just go home, will be fine. Like, you know, not everybody is treated the same, but for the folks who uh, appear in front of the court who clearly have some immediate need that needs to be met, such as housing or getting their benefits turned on or getting uh, connected to treatment, services, medication, that is what pretrial services is there. And that first sort of 48 to 72 hours are critical simply for stability. It's not about, do we get you into the drug treatment program immediately? It's, do we get you connected to whatever immediate crisis services you need? And pretrial services can do that in that 12, 24 hour period. We have lots of examples of that being done, New Jersey, New York. But the one thing that both of those places have done, New Jersey has done especially well, is invested at the state level in paying for pretrial services, setting up a statewide agency, building out the infrastructure, which frankly is much cheaper than even one night in jail. It's just a, a, a policy investment in the money to set it up. And in New Jersey, let's say this is a statewide agency. It's not probation or parole. It's an independent it's pretrial not. state agency. That's it's under the courts. Yeah, that's right. Probation would say that there are other courts here too. Um, I have a question about the partial se partially secured bonds issue. I know that the bail bonds industry is probably... Is, very skeptical of their success. I was wondering if you could talk about whether or not that is a, uh, a good idea. Yeah, good idea. I mean, I understand the financial presumption. You know, is there any evidence that finances have should have any role? I understand that, but given where we are in California, Proposition Twenty Five and whatnot, yeah. is this a compromise that may seem to work, or is this? Bad, just compounding bad idea upon bad idea. Matt and Allison, I can start talking about this because I ran a program uh, where we encourage judges to use unsecured and partially secured bonds, which are New York's uh, version of 10% bonds or deposit bonds. Um, I did that in the courts for three years before bail reform happened in New York. So let me speak a little bit to what we found from the data, and I will send um, the study of the program over to your team as well. And then I want to say a little bit about New York's law in which there's explicitly written in for cases in which money bail can be set, judges must consider an unsecured or a partially secured bond, and that has to be one of two forms of bail set. So we have a real life example statewide of where this is happening, because uh, New York, in some ways like California, wasn't quite ready to get rid of money bail. There were all kinds of compromises in the legislative process that led to bail reform in 2019. Um, so in running the program in the courts, and we were in two arraignment courtrooms in the Bronx and Queens and trained a number of other um, courtrooms across the state on using partially secured and unsecured bonds. What we found is that judges indeed used partially secured bonds instead of setting a bail bond uh, amount, which is insurance company bail bond in New York. And that's good as an intermediate sort of harm reduction step, if you will, because it meant that Families put down 10% to the court, they got that money back at the end of the case. They do not get the 10% back that they put down to the bail bond industry. Um, so it takes the profit out of what should not be a profit driven process in the first place. So to that extent, that's good. I think what is challenging though is um, judges uh, in New York after bail reform in the cases in which they can set bail are setting bail higher because they are sort of factoring in the 10% and saying, okay, if they only have to pay 10% to the court, I'm just going to make the overall amount higher. And so what we've seen pre bail reform and post bail reform in New York is that bail making has actually not gone up. That said, I think there are some ways that if California were to go down that route, um, there's some fixes, uh, you know, that that could be made. For one thing, bail schedules, I think, are a huge problem because they take away 
sort of discretion as well as they sort of, I think, encourage the use of bail. That said, there's an, a flip to this, which is bail caps. And you can imagine actually doing a study statewide and sort of actually having caps on, on certain kinds of offenses if indeed California is going to consider money bail that bail cannot be set above this amount and it has to be set as a partially secured bond, it could be less than 10%. There are ways I think to bring the overall bail amount down um, that jurisdictions can do. I do not think this is an ideal solution. I wanna say that very clearly, but to the extent that you're thinking of a middle ground and a step away from using commercial bail and ending reliance on money bail slowly, there is an intermediate step that the courts can take. And just, you know, as a coda to the New York story, um, we ran the program for two and a half years in the courts. Um, bail making went up um, during that time. Uh, people returned to court at the same rate as they would have otherwise. And uh, rearrest rates during the pretrial period were essentially the same as people who were released paying full bail or on insurance company bail bond or release on their own recognizance. There's really no meaningful difference, which again, calls into question why set bail in the first place. But, you know, to the extent that there's no difference, those are good numbers for us. Mr. Alsdor for Ms. James, do you have, did you want to jump in on this? I, I would just add that um, trying to limit the use, so if money is not going to go away, as Incha said, our ideal is that it does, but if it's going to remain in the system, I think as Humphrey dictates to really then use it as a release condition, which is what it was meant to be in the first place. <clears throat> so always making sure that it's set at an amount that someone can afford and pay without hardship, um, whether that's partial secured, unsecured, et cetera. Um, I, there's, again, I, I can't tell you which one is the right way to go, but making sure that it's used for that purpose, that is to use as an incentive to return to court Research doesn't prove it out, but use it for that way if that's what you have to do and make sure that it's not used as that proxy for detention. So I think that would be, to me, the sort of legislative fix there is to ensure that it's truly used and chosen as a release condition, just as much as pretrial services is or other conditions that the court can order um, in order to ensure appearance in court and safety. Oh, also, I mean, I think also California, it's in your it's in your memo. The stacking of bonds is also obviously problematic. So the affordability is not charge by charge, but the overall impact on someone. I just wanted to point that out. It's not common across the country, but you are seeing it in California. Got it. Um, do any of my colleagues have questions before I move on? I'll probably think of many tomorrow, but or later today, <laughs> but right now, no. All right. Well, thank you all. Um, you guys are the last but not least panel. This is all super duper helpful. I'm sure this is incredibly complicated. It's a really, in some ways, a specialized area of the law. It happens so quickly, right? Um, I sometimes I feel that criminal law reform focuses on, um, you know these huge long prison sentences because everything stays relatively still and you can watch it and you can, you know, you know, everything stays where it is. And this is so much churn and moving so quickly that it's very complicated and hard to, but it affects so many people is, you know, obviously what we're learning and what, what you know, and then it's, uh, you know, compounded complexity in California with the various different um, laws and politics and referenda and, that make it all the more complicated. We really do appreciate um, your help and we're gonna to continue to develop these ideas and I'm sure that we'll reach back out to you. So thank you all for your, for your time, I, I really appreciate it. We're gonna move on to public comment now. Um, this is our last panel uh, for today. So thank you to our panelists. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, excuse me. Sorry. I didn't. All right, um, so apologies there. We're gonna have two periods of public comment uh, for this meeting. We're gonna have some public comment today 
And then tomorrow we have to have another period of public comment before we make our final recommendations for the year. Um, what I'm going to ask people is to um, is to don't repeat yourself. You obviously have an opportunity to comment more than once because we'll have two different comment periods. But please keep your comments to one or the other topics and um, to make it go as efficiently. And honestly, you have more impact uh, on us. So um, for those listening on Zoom and you would like to comment, please select the raised hand function. If you're calling in, you can press star nine. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. And if you make a public comment, your name and phone number may be displayed as part of the recording. We're gonna take a minute now to see how many people who wanna comment and based on that, I'll see how long each person has to comment. So please, um, please get in line. And then Tom, will you please tell me how many folks are in line? No problem, so far it's nobody. All right. <laughs> All right, we'll wait one more minute. Here we go. We have one hand so far. All right, I'm going to cut it off. Uh, we usually have uh, our usual fans and longtime listeners and callers. Um, we, I guess I'll hear from you uh, tomorrow. I guess we exhausted everybody or maybe we covered everything today. <laughs> um, so, so with that said, uh, as our only uh, public comment uh, today, I, we have James Portman. Um, you have two minutes. Oh, great. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? We can. Oh, great. Um, so I 